October 2023 will be remembered forever in uh, British Columbia, specifically Greater Vancouver and some uh, cities in the Okanagan for Airbnb restrictions coming into play. And a lot of these communities, especially in Greater Vancouver, already had pretty strict Airbnb restrictions, but a lot of the outskirts, the island, lots of cities on the island, uh, Kelowna, Penticton, a lot of uh, typical vacation spots for summer in, uh, in the Okanagan were pretty wide open in terms of Airbnb and, and allowability. Uh, but as of, I believe it was, the, it was the middle of October 2023, there are a bunch of new Airbnb rules. And so maybe we start with just mentioning what they are, uh, and then we can kind of talk about specific cities and how this could put, put potentially affect supply of listings if, if air, uh, owners of Airbnbs are going to be selling and not putting them into the long-term rental pool. Or our thoughts on, well, how much of these will actually see the long-term rental pool? Let's jump into that. But before we do, Denny, <laughs> let's also talk about the fact that how does it feel to buy an Airbnb in Whistler just before they announce this? Because uh, for those that may not know, Denny uh, invested in a new venture in Whistler. Uh, and literally, it was right before this announcement. Was there a moment of a brief heart attack when you saw that news headline without going into detail? What have I done? <laughs> yes, absolutely there was. Yeah. It was a super, super curious timing. So we, I think we wrote an offer probably second week of September, second or third week of September, remove subjects at the end of September. Mm. And this announcement came out, uh, I think it was like the 12th of October. Yeah. So it was like less than two weeks later after we removed subjects and we hadn't even been completed yet. So the initial reaction was like, oh no. Worst we, timing yeah, ever. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then in reading through, obviously yeah. anyone who's uh, paid attention to these Airbnb reg regulations now, there are 14 exempt resort style, they call them cities, and Whistler's one of them. Uh, I mean, the the feeling of fear definitely popped up, but in actually reviewing, like Whistler is a different beast and the zoning is different. And there are covenants on title for these properties that say they want them to be um, vacation rentals. So... I didn't think that th these types of regulations were going to be able to adjust covenants on title. No, Whistler is a unique one, and yeah. it's been exempt from other changes in the past. So I, yes. you know, I think it's a. I mean, I, I personally have had a number of conversations over the years with people contemplating the same. You know, buying an investment property in Whistler that they can use out themselves. Yeah. So I, I mean, I love the venture that you're taking on. Um, and I mean, the overall, why would you do an Airbnb? And, and Denny, in short, why would you buy a Whistler Airbnb? And I say a Whistler property that you can Airbnb. Yeah, I'd say a few reasons. One, I've always loved Whistler. It's an hour and a half from the city. It is one of the coolest places that I've ever been on earth. It is continuing to grow in popularity. It is, when looking at like long-term, where do I want to spend my time? Whistler is always in the conversation. And the fact that it is it is a 90 minute drive that you can get to anytime when you have a stressful day, you could just like run up there quickly and spend a night and, and come back. It's pretty cool. The uh, amenities, the outdoorsy stuff, the skiing, the, you know, I'm not a biker, but I, I like hiking and the vibe that I get from Whistler just feels like you are so far away from the city, even though it's such a quick trip. So actually Airbnb specific, the the numbers, even at really high price points in Whistler, and here's a good example. The person that we bought this townhouse from bought in 2017. So we paid $1.538 million. What do you think they bought it for in 2017? Oh, jeez. I mean, it's gone on a bit of a tear. So I'm going to say it was under a million? Seven fifty. Oh. So they basically doubled in doubled. six years. And that's a bit intimidating as a consumer going and being like, does this keep going? How does this keep going? But when you're, when you're running it as a, like a, as a business, an Airbnb, you're just looking at the number and they spent, they put zero effort into marketing it. They put zero effort into furnishing it or making it look good for Airbnb or for short-term rental. And they did $86,000 in revenue last year. We were up there last week. We're going back again uh, for a night this week. And just doing like touch-ups and new furniture. And yes, this comes at a cost, but um, 
like the good ones up there that are run really well and, and are marketed really well are doing like close to 120K a year. So even at the, you know, the interest rate that we have currently on that place is 6.29%, which is not attractive. It's not oh, exciting in any way. I'd give you a heart attack like six months ago or yeah, <laughs> two years ago, but totally. that's the times now. Yeah. yeah. But even at the high interest rates, yeah. like if we can get to that, you know, higher end number for a unit like this at 120K, we are like break even. Got it. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting to, I say we, there's a, I have a couple of friends that we did this together, but it's pretty interesting to have a spot in Whistler, which is a cool factor as well, mm. uh, that you can use a couple weeks a year each when there's random nights throughout the winter that are not booked. One of us is going to go up there and have a ski day with their, you know, the other two have kids, but with their families and almost be break even. It's it's like a vacation property that doesn't drain the wallet. Yeah, yeah, it involves a little bit of work. Sure. Yeah, and I I, I get the allure. It's it definitely follows one of my rules of being like within two hours of the city because uh, you know I once had a place that I intended to do short term rentals out in the Okanagan, uh, up by Vernon, and it was four and a half five hours away, and it never really it was it was it became tough to fit it in. And a lot of it was because the weekend trip, it was just too much of a commute. Totally. But we'll get into that because Vernon's one of those areas that's impacted by this. Well, you single-handedly <laughs> yeah, that's true. Technically, changed I, the Airbnb rules. No, like, less than, just some rule of thumb, <laughs> folks. If, uh, if a strata doesn't have a short-term rental bylaw, <laughs> it doesn't mean they want short-term rentals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you post an Airbnb says sleeps 14, <laughs> that is enough to trigger the neighborhood to say, let's stop this guy from doing this. Let's change the bylaw. And that's what happened to me. So I, you know, I had a little bit of life lessons learned in that one. Mm. Uh, but I, I mean, ultimately, nowadays, that whole area is on the list. It's a community over 10,000 people. Uh, but we'll, we'll dig into that. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately like for your, from your perspective, Whistler Airbnb is, a, I mean, that is an area that's exempt. So let's just be clear on that. This is not, uh, Whistler is not changing. I think a lot of those values got to those price points because of the return that they get on Airbnb. Um, I also think that there's a future, like it's a pretty limited supply, world-class place. I've heard that their daily ticket for a, a, a pass is going up huge to like $300 a day or so. And they're trying to encourage more season pass buyers. But if, if the day, if a day to one day pass is 300 bucks a day, I, I could see those nightly rates getting even more astronomical than they are today. And today, well, actually, sorry, the October, November rate isn't too bad, mm -hmm. but the Christmas rate in Whistler is, oh, I can, it's like three times what it would be when I remember doing it. Like 10 years ago. Yeah. So that's the other interesting thing about investing in Whistler is yes, the price feels uncomfortable at the moment, but there's no, there's no supply. Mm. They're not building anything else. There's one piece of property that uh, I believe BD bought about two years ago from another developer that they <clears throat> plan to put phase one condos and townhomes on eventually, but it's a fairly small, like it would be a fairly small community. They might get like two or 300 units out of it, but that's it. There's no more land. So the, I, it's a supply issue up there, which is why um, why I liked it long term and why nightly rates I don't think are uh, going to be adjusted just because there's such a fixed amount of supply. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that you get a double in seven years like the person you bought it off of. <laughs> well, You're pretty nice. <laughs> well, let's get into the Airbnb. <clears throat> I, I mean, how is it going to impact? I mean, why do they do it? I mean, they did it to increase the supply of long-term housing. They want to, it, it's a political move to reduce short-term housing in hopes of moving the needle to create some more long-term homes for people. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, the biggest standout issue that I have with it is you're doing a move that's going to significantly impact some people at a time that's very challenging. Like, yes, housing is, is important, but we're in a time right now where rates are at an all-time high and you're going to potentially trigger some distress sales for some individuals that were relying on a certain amount of income. Um, there's not all areas are impacted evenly. And yeah, there will be like, there's a, there's a website. If you look it up, Airbnb permitted buildings in Vancouver. And, uh, you know, I looked it up before we were going to do this episode and on that list, there's over 30 buildings in Vancouver, mostly in the downtown core that do allow short-term rentals or did anyway. And I think from a Vancouver perspective, there's probably a lot of one bedrooms in those buildings, you know, maybe between all of them, there's probably 
I don't know, 30 buildings, call it 3,000 units, maybe 4,000 units. How much percentage of them are actually Airbnb? I, probably a small percentage would be my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's 10 to 20% of them that are Airbnb. And so th there is a potential there where it could flood the downtown market with a couple hundred units. Um, assuming that they don't transition their places from short term to long term. So I, I see some logic with it. It's just not the time to cause distress for people. Do yeah. this, wait till there's a little more market optimism. It, you know, the, I, I get, you know, politicians don't necessarily care about market timing or, or policy change timing, but this is a bad time to do that change for a lot of people. I wonder why this specific timing. Do you have any like gut feel on that? I, I, I think there's just, I mean, David, I think it's David Abbey that's fronting this. I, I just think that he, he wants to make a lot of changes and he's, he, he's not just, it's not just this. He's doing a lot of big things. And, um, I don't know if there's a timing angle to it. I mean, I, I don't think this is gonna, I think it's partly pointing the problem in a different direction. You know, I mean, we all in the industry know the bottleneck with supply that it's a combo of you know, municipalities not working together and, and the process of getting a bill, you know, the, the, the length of time it takes to get a building permit issued, um, the cost, the development charges, everything's, there's not a lot of incentive to develop. And I, I mean, I can speak from personal experience. When you go into a council meeting, you, it feels like you're staring at a bunch of counselors that think you're a profit hungry developer that's <laughs> making too much money. And when you calculate the risk on these projects, I don't think that very few people would do it. You know, the numbers really don't work out well uh, at the time that you'd take on a project and you hope you get market gain during that project to make, make up for it. But, you know, it's not like there's, when you look at the risk and the money that's going out to buy land, to build a home, especially in today's environment, um, it, 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 I mean, there's not a lot of people doing it. So I, I do think there's gotta be a mind shift change to open up the supply, mm -hmm. but in the short term, let's cancel Airbnbs to help the problem. And, and, I, and I, I do see that getting some, you know, political kudos by some that, that are frustrated with rental prices and housing mm -hmm. prices in the downtown core, where it may have a modest impact for a period of time. But out in the, you know, in the suburbs, I don't think it's gonna do much. You know, New Westminster, Burnaby, <clears throat> Quitlam. It's just not doing anything. I mean, there's yeah. so few Airbnbs in those, uh, outside of the city of Vancouver, before you go to the island in the Okanagan, there's so few Airbnbs. Like, who's who's Airbnbing a, a one bedroom condo and or a townhouse in Langley? Like, what's the market for that? Is there consumers that are looking it's for Airbnbs out there? Low no. percentage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. maybe just run through the changes for anyone who hasn't uh, seen them or or read them. But <clears throat> so as of uh, the important dates are May first, twenty twenty four. This is when this comes into play, and the main thing is. In order to run an Airbnb, you have to have a business license, which was there before. Uh, but it has to be your principal residence. So you can rent out rooms in your, uh, uh, you can rent out nightly rooms in your principal residence. Or if you like are traveling, you are then allowed to Airbnb your home with the business license while you're traveling. Uh, and a secondary suite. So if you have a coach home or a basement suite, that can be Airbnb'd with a business license. Uh, there's a bunch of things on this, uh, gov.bc page. So maybe read through it if you're curious, but the other big change, I mean, they mention all these fun word, like trigger words, like uh, task force and enforcement units and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love the task force. There's a task force for everything. <laughs> how many task force have we seen in 2023? Jeez. Yeah. Uh, and the other big thing is, uh, changing so most stratas have bylaws and in there they will say no short-term rentals and they'll they'll specify a time so they'll say no short-term rentals less than six months uh any 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 lease must be one year or whatever that may be there was lots that said minimum 30 days for a short-term rental and that's being changed in bc from a minimum of 30 days to a minimum of 90 days it's Got classified it. okay. as short term so anything less than 90 days is classified as short term where do you think this is going to have the biggest impact? It's kind of obvious when you, yeah. when you look at the list. Totally. We've chatted yeah. about this a few times, yeah. but like I look at Kelowna, even like as a, con as a consumer going to Kelowna each year, there are summers for golf trips or wine tours or whatever. Kelowna is such a big touristy spot in the summer and that 
I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I, w- I would guess 75% of the available product to rent is Airbnb, mm. is condos, is houses in that kind of downtown core. There aren't that many hotels. I don't know what the number is. Let's say there's 40 hotels in, in like downtown Kelowna. I don't know mm. what it is, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot. And they're already expensive, like six mm. or 700 bucks a night in the summer. So if you eliminate, I, I'm just guessing, let's say it's 50-50 for, for fun, but it's probably more than that. If you eliminate 50% of the product in a city like that, what is a hotel room in Kelowna now in the summer? 1200 1300 <laughs> It's got to go night? through the roof. If you, absolutely. The prices, uh, the, I'm not a Kelowna expert, <laughs> so, so mm-hmm. don't quote me on this, but the prices that those new towers are commanding in that downtown core is comparable to like Vancouver. Yeah. And... If you go back 10 years in Kelowna, it's, I mean, historically it was a discounted place. Like it was, you'd leave Vancouver for cheaper Kelowna properties unless you're on the water. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, when I vacation in the Okanagan, it's been a while, but I don't usually stay in the downtown core of Kelowna, but I imagine that area right now is probably one of the biggest impacted areas by this legislation. Mm-hmm. I mean, Victoria is on the list as well. And they're, uh, you know, I have an Airbnb in Victoria. I'm sure there's a lot of Airbnbs in Victoria Penticton's on the list. That's huge. You know, I, I believe it's within 15 kilometers of a major city. So that includes like Naramata. That's within 15 kilometers of Penticton. Oh, yeah. Um, Soyuz is exempt, fortunately, because <laughs> anyone that knows Soyuz <laughs> knows that it is a seasonal uh, destination. And I'm, I, I don't know the population of Soyuz. I don't know if it's over, it feels like it's over 10,000 in the summer. But Kelowna, Penticton, I imagine there's a lot of stressed landowners right now. And uh, I, from my understanding, the market's not as hot as it once was. Totally. What, I mean, <clears throat> this is a really small sample size, but I, I know someone that has a couple Airbnbs in Kelowna, like that downtown core, the typical one or two bedroom condo. And his immediate response is, I have no interest in being a long-term landlord. I bought this as an investment to Airbnb. And if I can't Airbnb it, I'm going to sell them. So I wonder, like, what are your thoughts on percentage of people that own units that are currently airbnb how many of them are throwing them into the long-term rental pool versus just going to be unloading them and taking the lot or you know well cashing out into something else let's acknowledge what's going on in the mind right now i mean at the end of the day why would they do short term because they have more control you know if a tenant's in there for one month or two or three they can go re-rent it for the new market rate when it mm-hmm. comes available again when you have a long-term tenant go in and it's a secondary property to you once that tenant moves in it, and that Basically, you can't get them out unless you're selling, unless you're moving in yourself or you sell the property and the buyer moves in. Um, there are other exceptions, but it's, it's more challenging just to evict a tenant. You know, mm-hmm. the rent eviction thing is, was used in the past, and I think that that's a tougher thing now. And we're also in, talking for Kelowna, newer properties. You're not going to do rent evictions on these newer properties. Yeah. So the, these property owners are faced with the fact that, well, hey, do I want to sell this place in November, December in this high rate environment and take a hit? Uh, or do I want to put a long-term tenant in there, wait for better times, and then ultimately be at the mercy of that tenant accommodating showings and keeping the place in good condition when I do want to sell down the road? Mm. So I, I, I think that there's people that have no interest in making that shift because they're going to lose control of their properties. But I also feel that there's people that will not want to sell at this time. Because they'll, you know, uh, wh- one stat that I read was approximately like half the revenue on Airbnb is from 10% of hosts. So there's a lot of people with multiple listings. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure Kelowna is one of those markets where if there's, there, there might be some people that have a dozen of these Airbnbs out there. Mm-hmm. And I think that individual is, I mean, they're going to be stuck. They're going to be in a, in a tough spot. I, 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 I mean, if that individual, are they going to sell 10 places at once and then watch the price be their own competition and let the take the hit or are they going to rent they'll probably put a few into long-term rentals and do a mix i i don't know i mean it's it's case by case but i I think there's a lot of people that have no interest in being a landlord and losing control of their place the only positive right now is for a landlord's perspective the market rent is higher than it was before which might help pay the mortgage it might i mean i can't speak for all these markets but the market rent for long-term rentals is up. That might be enough to justify putting a long-term tenant in there and, and selling another day. Because I think if you did the math, selling today 
versus putting a tendon there and waiting a year or two. He'd mm-hmm. probably be better off waiting a year or two, but yeah. you know, at, at the consequence of what, you know, you're, you're stuck for a year or two without looking at other opportunities. I think it's, it's important to note what areas we think are going to be affected most, but we're clearly not Kelowna or Penticton experts. So maybe let's focus this question on, on like greater Vancouver, but yeah. <clears throat> is this going to help long-term rentals? Uh, there might be an immediate shift with those 30 plus buildings in Vancouver, but the rest of the lower mainland, I think it is negligible. I think it's, it's not going to move the ticker nearly enough. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a lot of headlines, a lot of conversations, a lot of stress for people that are relying on their Airbnb property to pay the bills and for minimal increase in supply. And with the exception of a couple buildings in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so if it's not going to help long-term rentals, Vancouver specific, let's say, but what about resale? Will this increase the number of supply, like the uh, amount of listings that we see maybe in the first three, four months of next year? You know, in the, in the markets outside of Vancouver, like Kelowna, Penticton, mm-hmm. I'm sure they're going to have their little storm, but I would imagine the bulk of the Airbnbs that might increase the supply is going to be in the one bedroom condo world, mm-hmm. you know, and how many, yes, you're increasing the amount of listings for people to buy, um, but how many people are going to qualify for a $700,000 one-bedroom condo downtown in these rate, this rate environment? It's not going to be like a school teacher. It's going to be some, you, I mean, you, you have to have a high income. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I imagine that there's going to be a point where I could see prices coming off a little bit in the next few months, but I could also see supply well, you know what? It's going to be a supply-demand equation. It depends on supply. What do you think? <clears throat> I think in terms of supply, it'll, like for resale, it'll be a real short-term thing. And like you said, it's not necessarily the product type or the location that really we need more supply in, right? Yeah. The one or two-bedroom condo in, in downtown Vancouver, let's say one-bedroom 750 k and a two-bedroom's a million bucks. Like... W- this is not necessarily helping these like young families that are struggling to have more housing, you know, like get more housing. <clears throat> this is not adding supply of those like three bedroom type units in the suburbs that we need more of to mm. house people like this. So I just, I don't think it's the right product type and location that even if there is an extra three to 500 units that list in the first three months of next year, it's not really helping the overall cause. I think it's doing more harm than good because I think I can't help but think of the impact it's having on the few that are significantly impacted by this and the minimal supply change it's going to add. I mean, let's just go back a couple of years. When COVID hit, what did people do? People <laughs> left the city, Blood. you know, areas like the Sunshine Coast and, you know, Vancouver Island, the Okanagan became hotter than ever before. And during that time, people were vacationing in Airbnbs outside of the city and the nightly rates went way up and people observed this. So if you're, you know, if you're living in the city and you're frustrated with the daily grind and the, and the, and the rat race, and then you just see, Hey, you know what? I can move to the sunshine coast or Vic, you know, name the community that's over 10,000 people. And you know what? I'll live there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll set up an Airbnb. I'll buy a few Airbnb properties. I'll be my little business. Mm-hmm. And you, and you did this big life change because that was the trend and that was the way the world was working at the time. And then prices you're buying in a high market because uh, the sunshine coast was on fire in 2021 and then now they announce this um legislation that might prevent you from doing what you've you basically shifted your life to do over the last few years and i i can't help but think that that's just doing more damage than good and i and i i think vancouver i guess i'm not speaking about downtown vancouver i think downtown vancouver where you have a lot of short-term rentals and towers. There is an argument that that area is more up for debate, but when you blanket all of BC and you're including these communities that really like 10,000 people or more, there's a lot of communities that are just, I, I, just the damage is far greater than the supply that it's going to increase. Mm-hmm. If you're a hotel owner in downtown Vancouver, what is your reaction? I think the hotel owners have better lobbyists and voice than the Airbnb voice, you know? So I don't know what Airbnb's uh, uh, political stance, like how much effort they put into this stuff in BC, but they got to step it up. (laughs) But yeah, I I think hotel owners are laughing right now. Mm -hmm. I I think they're going to be loving life. I think their nightly rates are going to go through the roof. And, 
you know, maybe some other hotels will start popping up because I mean, a lot of these markets are going to be underserved. Some areas are now, I think just like, think about, think about tourism in, in Vancouver. What, what percent or what number industry is that in, in BC? Is that number two behind real estate? It's got to be it, up there. It's got to be top three, regardless. Yeah. Anyway, but what does it do to tourism over the next couple of years if nightly rates in downtown Vancouver, just outside of downtown Vancouver, go from five or six hundred bucks a night to nine hundred? Oh, it's going to deplete it. You know, it's uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, for my my family and I, when we go on vacations, I got three kids. We want a kitchen. We look yeah. at Airbnbs. You know, we're we're more likely to stay in an Airbnb than a hotel, mm-hmm. and. Yeah, I, I, I would, I, I, I owned a place in Predator Ridge and Vernon. I can't imagine that, like that, that place is built for short-term rentals. Vernon's one of those markets that's over 10,000 people that is impacted by this. I don't know if there's going to be any exemptions for those surrounding communities, but yeah, I, if, I would want to stay, I would want my own kitchen if I stayed there. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, these are first world problems in a way, but I, I do feel that like, it, it's it's going to impact some of these vacation spots for families considerably. Mm-hmm. How about you? What do you, what would you say? I mean, this to me is just <clears throat> a political move that's going to move the bar a little bit. Um, it's going to get talked about more than it's going to benefit the world. It's going to impact some people negatively a lot, and then it will be yesterday's news probably in a year from now. Totally. Yeah. Uh, for me specifically, like I look at the way that I've like kind of vacation over the last five years, and I. I really like going to the Okanagan in the summer. I like doing a wine trip, visiting wineries and just like chatting with people and learning about wine because I really like wine. And Naramata and Penticton is an area that I like to go. And the majority of the time I'm staying in an Airbnb. So if those don't exist anymore and the supplies cut in half and, you know, I think last year I spent 300 bucks a night in an Airbnb. If a hotel room now is six or seven or $800 a night, I'm not going. It, it it doesn't make any like why would you I don't know going to going gonna for have a winter vans everyone's gonna have their own hotel room driving around the province there you go <laughs> or camp, yeah camping <laughs> you imagine that's the consequences <laughs> sprinter van sales go through the roof <laughs> Carl's just uh, increased in value yeah <laughs> yeah <clears throat> I I any closing remarks on Airbnbs I just I th- I think the like initial reaction of this is gonna help Greater Vancouver I just think is not true. Uh, both in like the rental market, this is not bringing rents down. There's not enough supply that is going to come onto the market in terms of rentals. And I, and I don't think like <clears throat> maybe short term for six to 12 months in, in an area like downtown, maybe this increases the supply a little bit. So listings sit a little longer, maybe prices come off 5% or something like that. But I just don't think this is a long-term solution. And this is my problem with a lot of the legislation that's happened in my career in real estate is these are super short-term band-aid solutions that either uh, don't af- really do much and it's just a perception call or it's like a it's like a 12 to 24 month thing that you know helps you get voted in again you know I, I think the only thing that stands out to me it seems like it it's something that was blanketed through the province that maybe should have just been a Vancouver City test run yeah you know I it, it, it you can do it in stages <laughs> and you know knowing that if it, if if it's truly a goal to create housing in an area that needs it vancouver stands out a lot more than penticton to me but at the end of the uh article on the gov.bc page uh it does say future regulations will be drafted to exempt additional property types that are not intended that are not the intended target and inf- include um, things like fishing communities and fishing lodges or stuff like that. So, like, <clears throat> it they always like put these little details in into something like this that say we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> we might make some changes in a year or two, <laughs> but I don't know. Cause more stress. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's our Airbnb chat. That is it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs>